You're listening to episode number 90. Can you believe 90 of Liz's Healthy Table? Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. This week's show is all about one of my favorite comfort foods in the world and all the recipes that you can make with it, potatoes. You say potato, I say potato. You say tomato, I say tomato. Now you're going to sing it all day, I apologize. But potatoes, I love them. They are versatile. They're affordable. They are nutritious and they are delicious. And why I have never done a show on potatoes, I have no idea. So this winter, I've been really craving comfort food. And one of the recipes that I've been making a lot is for Hasselback potatoes. And I even went so far as to go onto Amazon and order this special little device where you put the potato in the middle and then you run the knife along these slats and you are able to cut the potato. So it's like the perfect Hasselback. So actually I should give you a link to that in the show notes for today's show. And I'm gonna do that. So yeah, totally on a jag with Hasselback potatoes. What about you guys? What kind of potato dishes have you been making? I actually do have a blog post this week with a roundup of various potato dishes. You know, uh, potatoes in soups, potato side dishes, potato main dishes. I'll give you a link to that in the show notes as well. So who's joining me today to talk about all things spuds? Well, I invited fellow culinary dietitian, Amy Murdahl Miller, to join me on the show. She's a farmer's daughter. As you'll hear, she grew up on a farm. She's a public speaker. She's a great speaker. She's an author, and she is president of Farmer's Daughter Consulting. So together, we're going to tell you all about potato nutrition. You know, they get a bad rap. So we're going to like dispel all the myths about potatoes. They are so nutritious. We're going to give you potato recipe ideas well beyond French fries, baked and mashed, but we will talk about those as well. And we're going to explain why potatoes are the perfect gateway for getting other veggies into your diet. For example, set out a potato bar and add all sorts of toppings like crispy Brussels sprouts or crispy shallots. You see where I'm going with this? The sky is the limit and I'm getting hungry. Anyway, before we get started, a few friendly reminders. If you love the show, tell a friend about it or post a review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. Follow me on lizishealthytable.com and be sure to check out the show notes from today's show for all the highlights. And if you want to engage more deeply with me and this podcast community, be sure to join the Liz's Podcast Posse page on Facebook. It is a closed group, but anybody can join. Check out the show notes from today's show, and I'll give you a link to the podcast posse. And now, here's my burning question for all of you. Which spuds for you? What are you craving? Tune in to my conversation with Amy Murdahl Miller, and we will satisfy any craving you might have for potatoes. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Liz. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So potatoes, you know, who knew? I put something out on Facebook, you know, what's your favorite potato recipe? You know, people are really passionate about potatoes. So I'm really excited you're going to be on the podcast today. Yeah, well, we couldn't be talking about a better vegetable today. Potatoes are the most loved vegetable in the United States. Well, that's good to know. They're popular, they're loved, they're comforting. And I think we all need comfort food right now. Anyway, before we get into spuds and which spuds for you. I thought you could just tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where you live. I know you've got a few kitties in your life, your website. So just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So I'm a dietitian and I'm a farmer's daughter from North Dakota. However, today I live outside of Sacramento, California. I run a consulting business called Farmer's Daughter Consulting, where I work with food companies, commodity boards, 
national brands, colleges, and restaurants. And, you know, the primary area of my work is helping build connections between people in agriculture and the rest of us who eat food. I think our food system is large and complex and much of it is global and and there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I just try to share information that makes um, everyone a more informed eater. Mm. And you're also a registered dietitian. I am, yes. You forgot to mention that. (laughs) (laughs) And you have some kittens in your life, correct? Yes, our darling fur babies. They are about 15 months old. Their names are Schroeder and Violet Gray. And, um, oh, Liz, they're so naughty. (laughs) It's a good time to have a kitten in your life or a pet, right? I mean, we're all kind of hanging out at home. I wish I had a pet in my life. Yeah, you know, I think... When we adopted these kittens, we had no intention of doing it. It just kind of happened. And my husband and I were in shock for a few weeks. It's a mm-hmm. long story. So never mind. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's been a real blessing during the pandemic. We've been home nonstop for, what, seven months now, eight months, nine months. And, yeah, it's been a joy to have them. They're just they're delightful. They're fun. They're funny. And every day there's some naughtiness that makes us laugh and cringe at the same time. <laughs> As long as they don't start to destroy your furniture. I mean, there are limits, right? (laughs) Well, you know, I put up the Christmas tree last weekend and I had to hardwire a tabletop tree to a metal table. And every morning the Christmas tree is just a little jauntily sideways, you know, and they straighten it and then the kittens attack it the next night. So we'll play this game for many weeks now Um, through the holidays. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. (laughs) You know, and I will say, kitties aside, I've never been to North Dakota. I have been to almost every state in the country. I've been to South Dakota. I have, I almost went to North Dakota, but I've never been there. And <laughs> what kind of farm? What, what kind of farm did you grow up on? So I grew up on a large diversified farm in the northeast corner of the state, about 35 miles from both the Minnesota and Manitoba borders. We specialized in very cold winters when I was a kid, and they still do. And then I went to college in California and discovered that, you know, winter without snow was pretty glorious. When I was a kid in the 70s, we had a huge cow-calf operation. My dad grew lots of corn to feed to the cattle. He had wheat and barley. Then in the late 70s, when my brothers were getting out of college, they started farming and started diversifying even more, adding crops like sunflowers. Today they grow, um, they still grow a lot of wheat. They no longer have the cattle and they do other crops like pinto beans, black beans, canola, which is so pretty in the summer. And they grow right along the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota, which is where potatoes grow in that part of the world. So I had a lot of potatoes growing up, but we never farmed potatoes commercially on our farm. Hmm. And and why did you become a dietitian? You, know, you went from the farm to California. And where did the, the, the love of nutrition kick in? Mm, yeah, when I was seven, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So I saw a number of dietitians when I was in grade school, middle school, high school. And when I was a junior in high school, the dietitian who I was seeing at the time, Mary Russell, very near and oh, dear yeah. to my heart, she said, you, um, different Mary Russell. Oh, not a different Mary. Academy, okay. Yeah, not our former <laughs> Academy president, Mary Blaine Russell. She said, you know, you would be a fantastic dietitian. Have you thought about that as a career path? And I said, no, but I will. And then I got into UC Davis, did my internship, and I did my internship at the University of Minnesota. And that's when I realized that having diabetes is, it's emotionally challenging at times. And I didn't want to talk to other people all day about managing their conditions. And so I took a different path. I went into nutrition communication, a master's program at Tufts. I then went into food marketing, and I've spent my career doing lots of communications, marketing, outreach work. Hmm. And you know, I did my master's at Boston University. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm obviously older than you. I'm dating myself here, but your path, I, I see your path and it's a little bit similar to mine. And I also know, and I never worked at the CIA, aka the Culinary Institute of America, but I believe you did a stint there as well. Yeah, I worked for the Culinary Institute of America for seven years. I actually worked out of my home because the job that I had was supporting continuing education programming for all four campuses. So the Napa Valley, 
San Antonio, Texas, Hyde Park, New York, and Singapore. I spent 50 to 70% of my time traveling. I was always living in the future because I, I was planning for events six to 12 months in advance of when they would take place. It was a great job, Liz. I got to work with guest chefs from all over the world. I learned so much. You know, I got to travel a lot, spending time in Singapore and learning about the food culture there had a big impact on my thinking about world cuisines and cultures. And, you know, the job was a blessing and a curse. The blessing was so many opportunities to learn and meet interesting people. The curse was it was it was exhausting. And I finally, after seven years, burned out. And that's when I said, I think it's time for a change in life and lifestyle. So that's when I started my own business. Hmm. How interesting. And, you know, this whole thing of world cuisines and global flavors, I feel is so hot right now. And potatoes really fit into that. Uh, you know, as I was getting ready for this podcast, I just sort of Googled, you know, most popular potato dishes around the world. It is amazing. Like every culture, you know, from South America to Japan has potatoes. It's not just an American thing. I mean, what's the deal with potatoes? Did did they start in the Americas and then work their way around the world? Where Where do potatoes fit into all that? So, you know, you're asking me a question that I don't know the answer to. I suspect that they started in South America because the potato culture in Peru is mm -hmm. kind of the, the best known in the world. More than 3,000 varieties of potatoes have been traced to, to Peru. And, you know, there are, there are breeding companies, for example, one that I consult with called HZPC out of the Netherlands. They have a line of potatoes, specialty potatoes called Perupas where the genetic material for that came out of Peru. They did a, a partnership and they have these amazing potatoes with names like Double Fun, where the interior flesh is, is creamy yellow and purple. One called Violet Queen, where the exterior is, is purple and the inside is purple. Another one called Mulberry Beauty, red skin, red flesh. Gorgeous potatoes with some very unique nutrition properties. And yeah, that we have we have partners in Peru to thank for that opportunity to bring those to market. Hmm. You know, when we think of potatoes, we think they're white or they're kind of yellowy, creamy <laughs> colored. But you know, you do see red potatoes, you see purple potatoes, obviously, there's sweet potatoes, which I believe would be a different story yes. entirely. But if yes. we're talking about the red potatoes and the purple potatoes, does that fall under the same umbrella as those white and yellowy potatoes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you ask, a typical American consumer, you know, tell me about your favorite potato variety. Um, he or she will likely say, well, I love Idaho potatoes. That's probably the best known. Those are those big russets with the rough skin and the white interior. Great for baking. Or they'll say something like, I love Yukon Gold. Now there is a variety called Yukon Gold. It's quite old. And today it, it's almost a generic term like Kleenex. Yukon Gold, people use it to describe any potato that has yellow skin. Some people may say fingerling. That's an actual variety. Again, a very old variety. If you talk to chefs, most chefs will say to me, I love Red Bliss. Again, that's a that's an actual variety name. It's red skin and white flesh. But Today, there are over 200 varieties of potatoes sold here in the United States, grown by growers all over the country. And, you know, our, our, our love of potatoes is well known, but our appreciation of potatoes and the diversity within potato production and the nutrition properties and sensory properties, we're just starting to learn and appreciate and, and use the right potato for the right application in our home kitchen or in commercial kitchens. Yeah. And, I, and so there's this website, potatowonder.com, which I believe you worked on with HZ or ZPC. Is that correct? Because it's a very cool That's website and it goes through different potato varieties. And they actually sent me, thank you very much, a package of different potatoes, different varieties. And there's, like you said, it's like we, it's the, the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of potatoes out there and we don't know what yeah. to do with them necessarily. Yeah, the Potato Wonder website highlights eight different varieties, but that's just a teeny tiny snapshot. The potatoes that HZPC breeders have developed over the years, they sell hundreds of varieties of potatoes all over the world. And here in the U.S., more than 50 of their varieties are being grown today. So give me an example then of a few potato varieties. So people listening will say, yeah, I know the russet potato. Like Amy, today I literally made baked stuffed potatoes. I got on, on a jag. I was like, okay, I'm doing this podcast and <laughs> so good, so comforting. And I roast 
the new potatoes, you know, those red potatoes all the time. There's certain things that I know I, I just do. It's like a habit, right? But what's the, like, give us maybe three potato varieties and the right job for that potato. Popular, you know, different ones yeah. people will, will relate to. So one of the challenges in the work that we're doing is we have all this variety specific information we want to share, but the potato supply chain here in the U.S. has been kind of lagging behind other parts of the world. In Europe, you can find potatoes by specific variety, and I'm talking about in supermarkets, labeled with the best or um, a few of the best cooking techniques for that variety. Here in the U.S., we have less of that information available to us when we're choosing a potato um, in a supermarket. But if you're, for example, a public shopper in the southeast, you can find Colombo potatoes. So they are yellow skin, yellow flesh. They're amazing potatoes. They're, they're a little creamier. You can do things like slice them and grill them. They're great for mashing with skin on. So that's an example of a variety where, where people in the Southeast can find them by that variety name. Here in California, we have growers who grow a variety called Sifra, S-I-F-R-A, and that's a yellow skin, white flesh variety. I love Sifra because for mashed potatoes, they cook so quickly. I quarter them, I boil them, and 12 to 15 minutes later, they're ready for mashing. Um in a few parts of the country, up in Washington State at certain retailers, people can find a variety called Mozart. It's grown in many other areas, but Mozart is a red skin yellow flesh variety. And that one's really cool because when you cook it, you get these flavor notes and aromas of things like buttered popcorn and pancake. And the aroma of the potato when it's steamed or, or baked, you start sniffing it and you're like, oh, I mean, it's just the most comforting variety. A few People have access to the mulberry beauty variety, which is red skin, red flesh. Probably one that you would never see labeled, but it's it's really amazing. It's called Ricky Russet. It looks like the classic Russet Burbank potato, but Ricky Russet has a creamier interior flesh. So it's got that classic brown skin that's kind of rough textured, but the white flesh is creamier, fluffier, and Chefs are getting really excited about it because it's a variety that, you know, is familiar to diners. But from a chef's perspective, you have to do less to it. You know, if you're doing something like a Hasselback potato, maybe you don't need as many indulgent toppings on it to get kind of that creamy potato mouthfeel that we love, but for which we oftentimes add things like lots of butter and sour cream and whatnot. Mm, okay. So speaking of butter and sour cream. This is my natural segue, of course. <laughs> you know where this is going. People often say potatoes are not healthy. They're too high in carbs. I don't eat potatoes. You know, people get shamed out of, you know, like eating their favorite vegetable. And I want you to dispel the myth. You know, potatoes get this bad rap. Tell us why. Let's talk nutrition because potatoes are super nutritious. In fact, you know, I was, I had posted on Facebook and one of the comments that came in was from, uh, Michelle Redmond, who's a fellow culinary dietitian, and she said that, she said, it's, it's interesting to me how potatoes have been stereotyped as a starch and white food linked vaguely to low nutrients. She says it helps to share the fiber and concentrated potassium levels so that people understand that they actually, you know, do, you know, they are nutritious. So, so yeah, so let's talk why they get a bad rap and let's talk nutrition. Well, you know, I think for a number of years now, there's been this sentiment that we shouldn't be eating white foods. You know, we shouldn't be eating white bread. We shouldn't have white sugar. Um, we shouldn't eat white vegetables like potatoes. You shouldn't eat rice. And the fact of the matter is potatoes are a vegetable. Um, like other vegetables, they're mostly water. Potatoes are about 80% water by weight naturally contain no fat, no cholesterol, no sodium. They're rich in vitamin C, good source of potassium, lots of fiber if you eat the skin. You know, about 30% of the fiber in a potato is in the skin. And potatoes aren't all the same from a nutrition perspective. What I just told you is like the average data, but there's a lot of variation, for example, in the amount of carbohydrate in a potato. It's inversely related to the amount of water or the moisture content. So that Sifra variety that I mentioned that I love so much for mashing, that's a higher moisture content potato. It's one of the reasons why it cooks so quickly. 
when it's boiled or steamed for mashed potatoes. There's also huge variation in the amount of vitamin C in potatoes. There's variation in the amount of potassium. So a potato isn't a potato. Each variety has its own unique nutrient profile. And then if you start talking about things like antioxidants or phenols, you know, that's going to depend on the intensity of the skin color, the stress conditions when it's growing, the color of the flesh color. So there's a lot of variation here and there's a lot to appreciate. But one fact that shocks a lot of people, on average, potatoes contain about 60% more potassium than a banana. So if you're like an athlete and you want some recovery foods, a banana is great, a potato may be even greater. And then think about a potato that's been mashed with milk. So you're getting the potassium from the potato and the dairy. Kind of amazing. A cup of baked potato has as much fiber as a cup of fresh strawberries. You know, so I could go on and on doing these comparisons. I never want to throw another produce item under the bus. You know, you shouldn't trade off one produce item for another. You should be consuming more fruits and vegetables. We want people to put more of them on their plate, in their bowl, in their smoothie, you know, however you're eating today. So, you know, potatoes are an awesome vegetable and you should have more vegetables in your life. Right, right. And, and they're almost like a gateway too. Like if you think about it, if you love <laughs> potatoes, you know, like what else, what would be the next? I mean, I'm not saying French fries necessarily. I mean, maybe that's partly why potatoes get a bad rap too, just because French fries are kind of like the number one favorite veggie in this country. But I do think if you like potatoes, it's it's a gateway to another vegetable, perhaps. Yeah. Or, you know, to, to bring along a friend. I mean, you know, like I think about the traditions of Irish cooking where they mash the potatoes with the cabbage, the Colcannon potatoes. You know, how can you bring along a friend with the potato? You know, I have a husband who's a very picky eater. And I made something recently. It's this Eastern Mediterranean carrot dip with, you know, steamed carrots and toasted almonds and extra virgin olive oil and lots of spices and aromatics and harissa chili paste and, and served it to him on a cracker. And he said, this is so good. I want to eat this again. And I want to dip French fries in it. I want to dip tater tots in it. You know, so there's an example of bringing along a friend with the potato. He wanted to bring that spicy, creamy carrot dip along for a ride. You know, and I think there's lots of strategies, whether you're a mom or, or a spouse with a picky partner or whatnot, or you're just somebody who likes to get creative in the kitchen. You know, I'm thinking too, you could bake potatoes and then use that, that dip as like a topping. That would be really good. Yeah, I was talking to a chef the other day. He's the head of culinary excellence for UMass Amherst. And he was talking about what they're doing with their reinvented potato bar, baked potato bar for 2021 and his excitement over talking about different vegetable toppings. For smaller baked potatoes, he and his team are using those Ricky russets I was talking about. So you get this lovely creamy baked potato and then you start topping it with things. He was talking about like crispy Brussels sprouts and crispy fried shallots, which the Vietnamese consider their bacon. You know, and so Chef Alex was just going on and on about what he and his team are putting together for students who will be back on campus, hopefully next semester. Mm -hmm. What what else would go in that topping on that topping bar? That sounds so good. Oh yeah, he had endless ideas. He was talking about you know crispy tofu and lemongrass and things like that. But I mean, if you sat down with a group of creative culinarians, the list would be endless, Liz. I mean, I'm sure if you and I wanted to go off in that direction, we could spend the rest of our time today chatting about that. Mm, yeah, potato bar. Yeah, we'll, we'll do we'll do a follow up show. But you know, and and UMass really is known to having for having like the best food in the country, the best college food in the country. So I hope those kids get back to school sometime soon because I know UMass, I don't think went back to school in the fall. So I'm sure they're chomping at the bit to get those kids, you know, back in those dining halls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a tough time for everybody in campus dining right now or is it colleges and universities mm -hmm. period, right? Oh, However, yeah. let's be honest, this year has been hard for all of us, right? Oh, incredibly oh. hard. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of cooking fatigue and, you know, and I, and, and there's also a lot of, you know, people who are struggling, you know, financially. We, we know that the food, food bank usage and food pantry usage is just on the rise. It's, it's out of control right now. And, and, you know, potatoes are, are so affordable. So, you know, if you are on a budget, I think potatoes to me would be like the go-to vegetable to include in that family meal. 
Absolutely. And we've seen a lot of interesting data out of re retail that 10 pound bags of potatoes have been growing the fastest in terms of potato sales at retail, that people are recognizing potatoes store well, that the family loves them, and that at that 10 pound bag price, you're eating a lot of great nutrition there that, that you know, you can have on hand for a few weeks if you can't get out. Right now here in California, most of our state is under mandatory stay-at-home orders where we can only go out once a week for an essential reason, right? So I'm really planning my grocery shopping thoughtfully and carefully. Mm. And I like the idea of, of baking potatoes and setting out that bar and then thinking of different ways to add interesting toppings. So it's not just mm -hmm. the same old sour cream and cheese and bacon bits. You know, it's using other veggies to kind of cram right on top and then serving yes. with salad on the side or, you know, whatever, but just kind of staying very, very veggie focused. And I think potatoes help us do it. If you were going to make French fries at home, let's say, you know, we do not all have a deep fat fryer, let's be real. But if you're going to make French fries from scratch at home, how would you make them? What kind of potato and how would you do it? <laughs> Why are I should have you told you not to ask me this question because my attitude is, why would you do it? Like a deep fat fried French fry is kind of the gold standard. And when you drop a French fry into a fryer, the, the interaction between the surface of that French fry and the oil immediately creates that crispy outer exterior. The inside gets steamed. The exterior gets a little crispier and crunchier. If it's double fried, as every French fry should be, then you're going to have that perfect creamy to crunchy balance in a French fry. And at home, I just don't think like a baked French fry is the same. Now, I don't have an air fryer, but I have friends who have been buying them like crazy since last Christmas, right? When they just kind of exploded in the marketplace. And people are talking about the success that they're having there. I do know that the company that I'm working with, they in Europe have released something called Fries for All. And it's an air fried French fry that has a proprietary coating on it. And I have tried these and it's amazing, Liz. Like most French fries, they're great when you get them hot. A few minutes later, they're still great. And then they start to cool off and you're like, meh, okay. Yeah, Not that exciting. These air fried French fries with this coating, they don't maintain the heat, but they maintain this crispy texture and flavor that is so beguiling. And you know, when you're air frying instead of deep fat frying, you're getting fewer calories because of the, the difference in fat content. But okay, back to your question, how to make a great French fry at home. I don't, I never do it. I mean, I love French fries, right? But if I'm going to love a French fry, I'm just going to go out and get it oh, at a restaurant where they enough. do it with fresh oil <laughs> and, you know, the right potato for that application. So if you were, let's say we go to Europe, because someday we will go to Europe again, hopefully that product you were just talking about, is that like a frozen product people would buy or fresh and then they would cook it in their air fryer or you buy it already made? Yeah, you buy it already made. And then you cook it in your air fryer. It's basically right now been released for food service use in Europe. So yeah, fries for all. There's some talk about potentially bringing it to the U.S. I hope they do. I mean, you know, it doesn't just have to be an air fryer. There are special convection ovens that a lot of food service operations have that can do this the same way. And to have, you know, a French fry with fewer calories, you know, that's appealing to people because we want people to feel great about eating this vegetable called potatoes. And we know people love them. Let's reduce the guilt. And if the if the way to do that, you can have French fries, you know, as often as you want, but there's there's less fat and calories, then okay, great. But with that said, Liz, I mean, as a culinarian and a nutritionist, I want people to eat them in more ways with more vegetables, exploring more cuisines, more cultures. You know, the top three ways we eat them here in the U.S., French fries, mashed potatoes, baked potatoes. We can do so much more with potatoes. Mm. So from this conversation, let's see, I'm, I realize I need a, an air fryer. That's, I don't know why I don't have one, but I need an air fryer. Dear Santa, Liz and has been a very yes, good girl. <laughs> please drop it down my <laughs> chimney, even though I have a gas fireplace. And I need to use the word beguiling a lot more because Aww. I love that word. And that's going to be my word of the day. So thank you. Thank you for that. Mashed potatoes. What do you like to add to your mashed potatoes? So. I always buy a Yukon Gold type potato. I will tell you though, at my grocery store, they do amazing work with produce. But in their section of the bulk yellow potatoes, I can bring home eight of them, cut them in half, and some of them have a white interior. Some of them have a pale yellow interior. Some of them have 
a slightly darker yellow interior. So you never know what you're getting in that bulk bin. But I like that type of potato because it's a moister potato to begin with. And I wash them, I quarter them, I steam them, and then, you know, and I leave the skin on. And then sometimes I mash them with milk that I've steeped with fresh rosemary. I love cooking with rosemary. Some people don't love that herb. It's one of my favorites. And you steep the rosemary in in the milk. And then when the potatoes are cooked, the milk is warm, mash it. Sometimes I, um, if it's a really high moisture content potato, after the steaming, I'll just add some extra virgin olive oil and, and some sea salt and fresh cracked pepper. Sometimes I do, you know, milk and sour cream and top them with a little cheddar cheese. You know, it depends on what I'm pairing them with, but steeping the rosemary in the milk is one of my favorite mashed potato preparations. Mm, I love rosemary. I actually use it, you know, when, I, when I'm toasting nuts, like in a skillet, this is unrelated mm. to potatoes, <laughs> I'll add some fresh rosemary and I'm like, so, you know, a little olive oil, a little rosemary, I throw in a handful of walnuts. Oh my gosh, there's sugar, a little salt afterwards, a little pepper. Yep. Delish. I'm right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> love, I wish love, you were love. my neighbor right now so I could go over and have a glass of wine with you and eat mm. some of those rosemary nuts. No, I wish I was your neighbor because I'm on Nantucket and it is gray and cold and I'm afraid to even leave my house, but I'm forcing myself today because, Aww. yeah, you know, you got to get out. You got to get the fresh air. So that is what I'm doing. So um, we have another colleague, Christine Rosenblum. She lives outside of Atlanta, down in Georgia. She she wrote on my Facebook, she said that every time she makes rice as a side dish with dinner, her husband, Rob, says he feels cheated out of the potatoes. <laughs> so, Aww. Rob, so, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And then Lauren Swan, another dietitian, she says the other night she roasted white potatoes with fresh herbs, probably rosemary and thyme. And she said her kitchen just smelled so savory and it, it's just like the best comfort food. So people really, you know, they respond, you know, when you say, yeah. you know, potatoes, it's like just a great memory food. You know, I'll go to that point about Chris and Rob and rice versus potatoes. I'm an equal opportunity, you know, culinarian and eater. But I think one of the things that when people think about, you know, interchanging the quote unquote starch on the plate, if you have a cup of baked potato, uh, that's 130 calories. If you have a cup of rice, it's 210, cup of pasta about the same, 205. So, and the carbs are dramatically different in those. So as someone with type one diabetes, you know, I'm always thinking about how I'm going to balance my carbohydrate in a meal. And, you know, I think for people who just think, oh, potatoes are just a starch, they're not. Higher moisture content, greater nutrient package. So think about that as a, a vegetable component on your plate you can feel great about. And, you know, if, you, if whomever you love and you're cooking with, if they said rather have potatoes a hundred times out of a hundred, you should say, yeah, let's have potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? And, and a sweet potato, is that just a cousin to the white potato or is it a totally different animal? Totally different. Yep. Mm, different like genus, species, whatever. Yep, exactly. Yep. Different, different type of, you know, tuber versus storage root and different nutrient profile and yeah, but another, you know, another great vegetable, but nothing related to the potatoes we're talking about That's today. That's so funny. Yeah. Makes sense. So I thought we could do, I've never done this on the show before, but I'm going to give us 60 seconds. We're going to do a recipe smackdown and we are going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And in 60 seconds, I don't know if I'll be able to count, but we're going to see how many different kinds of potato dishes and potato preparations applications we can share with people in the 60 seconds. And we, we can't repeat each other. So we're probably going to get very tongue tied. So I'm going to I have my little stopwatch here on my phone. And when I say start, you go first, and then I'll go and then we'll go back and forth. And then I'll say stop at 60 seconds. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, here we go. And uh, go. Okay, I'll start with my husband's favorite twice baked where you bake them, scoop out the middle, mash that put them back in top of a little cheese, bake them again. All right, Amy, we have to start over. <laughs> Just list it and go, because otherwise we're only going to mention four. <laughs> okay. All right. You got it, Liz. <laughs> okay. This this could take a while. All right. I'm talking fast, rapid fire. All right. Here we go and go. Twice baked. Hasselback. Hash browns. Shepherd's pie. Home fries. Potatoes gratin. Indian pakoras. Bubble and squeak. Ooh, like that. Potato cakes. Potato salad. Um, twice roasted. Potato skins. 
smashed and fried in olive oil. Mm, beef stew with potatoes. Mm, tater tots. Cheesy potato soup. Shredded hash browns with green onions. Yum. Potato lockies for Hanukkah. <gasps> Delightful. And applesauce. Mm. Um, shoot. Uh, potato bread. Ooh. Uh, tuna salad and a soie. Mm, now you're going down the menu path. <laughs> oh, dear. Have you stumped me? Liz, you might have stumped me. Keep going. Keep okay, going. Potato, potato salad with cucumbers. Oh, chickpea curry with potatoes, an Indian dish. Baby potatoes boiled with butter and fresh dill. Done. <laughs> we started strong. Bubbles and squeak. Huh? I got you. I got you. That's a British dish, by the way. Uh, yes. <laughs> and bangers and mash. Did I say bangers and mash or bubbles and squeak? Bubble and squeak. I, I love the name of both of them. The British have such a good sense of humor. Bangers oh, and mash and bubble and squeak. I love that. Yeah. Got to keep yeah, it I fun. Just, I just watched an episode of Bizarre Foods recently that where they were talking about bubble and squeak, and it just puts a smile on your face, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> You're so funny. So funny. Um, yeah, oh, you know what? Someone else that, again, my Facebook, because it just like blew up with everybody commenting on all their favorite potato dishes. But Jen, who another dietitian who follows me on Facebook, she said she grew up in Idaho. She says, I assumed everyone ate potatoes three times a day until I moved out of the state. And she said that her favorite was hash browns at breakfast, potato salad at lunch. And she does say her mom makes the best potato salad on the planet. And I'm going to give it to her. And then a baked potato bar at dinner, which you and I were talking about. So imagine growing up and you just make this assumption that everybody in the world eats potatoes three times a day. Yeah, well, where I was growing up, we had potatoes twice a day for, for dinner and supper every day. So that was, yeah, I remember coming out here to California for college. And I was like, wait, rice? Why would you eat rice? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like such a waste. Why are you eating yeah. rice? <laughs> so do you have like a favorite, favorite potato recipe? I mean, it sounds like you make them all the time, but is there something that jumps out as like your absolute favorite? Oh, you know, it's like the childhood comfort thing. So when I was a little kid, my mom would quote unquote, steal baby potatoes from the potato plants in her garden. So she'd loosen up the soil around a potato plant and then reach down into the soil and pull out a few baby potatoes. Um, and this would typically happen in, you know, early July. And she would boil them and then put butter and fresh dill also from her garden on them. And to me, that is just so comforting because I was always fascinated by my mom stealing something like, mm -hmm. you know, as a little kid isn't stealing wrong, but stealing the potato from the plant and then letting the other potatoes mature and get bigger. So anytime I'm home in North Dakota during that time of year, they now sell baby potatoes like that, baby red in the local grocery stores. And so I'll always pick some up and, and enjoy that with the family. Sweet. I like that. I like that. You know, for, for me growing up at Hanukkah time, my mom made the best potato lockies, potato pancakes. Mm. Very painstaking. Like they take a lot yes. of time, a lot of oil. And I was just reading Joan Nathan wrote in the New York Times about this new way she's going to, she's making potato lockies. And I'm totally trying this this week. And she basically, she'll bake potatoes till they're almost like a russet, till it's almost done, still a little bit raw on the inside. And then she'll let it cool, slice it in half lengthwise. And then she'll shred it on the large holes of a box grater so that the flesh part is facing the shredder and the skin is like near her hand. Yep. Shred, yep. shred, shred, but not the skin. And then she'll literally add salt and pepper. She'll mound them up into little rounds, you know, and little patties, little pancakes, and she'll just cook them in oil that way. That's it. Just like, and because the potatoes are already cooked, she says she can just store those in the fridge and do it, you know, the next day she can cook them. They don't oxidize because they're cooked already. So they Brilliant. don't turn brown. Yeah. Simple. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the easiest thing I've ever heard of. So I'm totally going to try that. Yeah, that's a great technique. And I bet you have so many list listeners who are going to love knowing that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I actually finally subscribed to the New York Times. I don't know why I never did it before online. So you get, you know, all these recipes. And now, of course, I'm going to be standing in front of my computer forever because I can't seem to peel myself away. So um, a few folks on my Liz's podcast posse page on Facebook, uh, Amy said that she loves potatoes, especially right now with trying to limit her trips to the grocery store. There you go. She says potatoes are making a great addition to my meal plan since they can keep for a while in the pantry. She says one of my favorite meals 
to dig into lately has been a twice-baked potato using a little plain Greek yogurt, then topped with shredded cheddar and frozen broccoli. There you go. And and Amy, I will say, try the broccoli rice, the riced broccoli, because it is so convenient. And I love that product. And then Meredith says that potatoes are definitely her favorite food. She says, I love them anyway. Roasted, fried, mashed, baked, made into pancakes. So good. And she says, not really a fan of sweet potatoes, but any other variety is fantastic. One of my favorite breakfasts is to shred a potato, skin on, then mix with an egg, onion, onion powder, actually, and salt and pepper, fry it up on top of the runny egg. So that's like a potato laki. So, you know, like we're hearing these themes over and over and over again, just like total comfort food. So good. I will tell you, um, Trader Joe's has a fantastic shredded potato item in their freezer section now. And they're so great for making those little like, you know, shredded potato patty, just like what we've been talking about, Lockie. But in this case, I make them and I put a little smoked salmon and creme fraiche and, and chives on them for a little, you know, like three bite French item for Scott and me. And that's a really great convenience product, you know, so. Does it come, Amy, does it come like you're saying already in the shredded patty or do you buy it shredded and patty it up? It's a bulk bag with the shredded potato in and you can take out as much or as little as you want. And it's a Ziploc bag. I mean, great package design. And it's a Trader Joe's branded product. Hmm. And then you just form it into the patties and cook them Mm -hmm. that way, just in a little bit of oil. Yep, I use a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, and yeah, Yum. really, really great, convenient. And it's really great potato flavor. I don't know what variety of potato they're using, but it's really great flavor. They have a pressed hash brown patty. That potato flavor isn't as pleasing to me as the loose shredded mm. potato. And I like how you topped it with the smoked salmon and a little bit of creme fraiche, or you could use sour cream or Greek yogurt, yep. whatever you have in the fridge, and chives. Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. Love, love, love this. So many, you know, I, I've been trying to find like, you know, the silver linings to this horrible pandemic, you know, we're home and we're cooking a lot. You know, for me, one of the silver linings has, you know, been that I'm cooking more and I'm trying new recipes. And I think it's a good time for us to, to do that and, you know, share those meals with close family and friends. And, you know, what, what's been the silver lining for you? Have you, have you been thinking about that? Oh, a lot. Um, You know, I think one of the biggest blessings in my life this year has been closer connections with my family. I'm the youngest of five kids. There's nine years between me and my closest brother. And we have spent a lot more time connecting with each other on the phone. Um, I haven't gotten them to Zoom yet, but, you know, there's still hope. There's still a few weeks in 2020. And, you know, I've gotten these closer relationships with my older siblings, which has been really delightful. There's also a blessing and a curse in 2020. My husband was furloughed for seven months. So he has been, well, he's back at work now, sort of. He's a hearing aid dispenser working with typically older clientele. Anyway, so he's been home and he's been doing so much work in our backyard. And we've got this beautiful backyard, but now it's even more beautiful. He's built some new fences and we've just been, you know, spending more time together, making our home life better. And, you know, we've been home a lot, right? Like everybody else, but it's, it's getting to be more lovely to be at home. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what it's going to be like to go back out and travel again for work. Yeah. It's going to be weird going back to that, but hopefully, you know, with your HZPC folks, (laughs) you can maybe arrange a little tour of, you know, maybe a farm for, for, you know, some dietitians who love farm tours or, or how they breed the potatoes. Like I'm just so fascinated by it. You know, in fact, I was going to ask you this and maybe we'll make this our last question. How are potatoes grown? Are they grown in a sustainable way? Because again, you know, people don't really understand, you know, where their food comes from, where it's grown, how it's grown. Is it grown sustainably? Yeah, you know, potatoes, potatoes are a big crop around the world. HZPC, for example, sells seed potatoes in 90 countries around the world. They're the fourth largest crop grown in the world, you know, behind corn, wheat, and rice. Potato plants are really efficient when it comes to using water. They're seven times more efficient than crops like corn, wheat, and rice. And potatoes are really productive in terms of the yield per acre or hectare. You can grow potatoes on half the acreage that you need for something like rice or a quarter of the space needed to grow things like a bean or a chickpea. 
So it's why they're grown around the world. They're versatile in terms of growing conditions. They're highly productive. They don't rely on water as much as other crops. And, you know, here in the U.S., potatoes are grown all across this country. Certain regions are known for certain types of potatoes. You know, the Idaho, the, the, the russet type potatoes there where I grew up in the Red River Valley, the red skin, white flesh are really predominant, as are potatoes that are used to make potato chips. Washington State does a really incredible production of a lot of more specialty varieties. Um, most of the potatoes grown in the U.S. are conventionally grown. It's hard to grow potatoes organically. It has an impact on appearance and quality. You can have a lot of food loss growing organically because of pests and conditions that affect potatoes. So, you know, from a sustainability perspective, the conventional production gives you higher yields and less losses. And that's important in sustainable production. We want to grow great quality food limiting environmental impact and have as much of that food go into our food system versus being lost for various reasons. Good, good stuff. Well, it's a good, it's a good food to, you know, add back to your diet if you've eliminated it. So many great reasons to, to eat it in terms of nutrition and all these great culinary applications. So thank you so much for sharing all of your potato wisdom with us today. And before I let you off the hook, would you tell people how they can find you on that world wide web out there? Yeah, absolutely. If you want to learn more about me and my business, check out FarmersDaughterConsulting.com. And are you on like Instagram, Twitter, or are you on social media? I am on almost every platform. I am at Amy Myrdal, M-Y-R-D-A-L Miller, at Amy Myrdal Miller. Great. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Amy, so much for joining us today. I learned a lot, so I appreciate your time. My pleasure, Liz. And to all my listeners, I would love to hear from you, you know, stop by the show notes from today's episode and tell me about your favorite potato recipe, because people are clearly passionate about potatoes. If you love the show, tell a friend about it, post a review on Stitcher Radio, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table.